our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous. I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, we've been having some technical difficulties, so we're starting a little bit later than usual, but we appreciate your patience. I'm watching you all on Restream and I'm seeing everyone pile into the clubhouse room. Uh, hopefully I'll have a chance to uh, allow you to query our guest in a few minutes. Uh, and we were looking, I'm looking at the Restream, seeing if there's anything you guys want to get onto right away. No. Uh, Susan, are we going to stay on YouTube for the moment? Yeah. All right. And if Alex says goes off the rail too far, we will. <laughs> no, we you will. won't. But <laughs> I want to see what happens. I'm, right, I'm tired of being milk toasty. All right, YouTube. we're tired. We're tired of hiding from the YouTube police. So let's please welcome Alex Berenson. Unfortunately, you can't see him. You can hear him. So Alex, welcome. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Drew. There you are. The book, the new book, is Pandemia: How Coronavirus Hysteria Took Over Our Government, Rights, and Lives. And I love the way you framed it as an hysteria. I've been saying this for about a year that something happened in the collective personality of our of the Western world, really, where histrionic disorders seem to prevail. Um, you know, people refer you're, to it as a mass psychosis from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I've started talking to people on this stream. Like I talked to uh, Art, um, I'm blank. I have, I have COVID brain, uh, Alex, now, so occasional yeah. things will block on me. Uh, what's our, what's Arthur's last, uh, Kaplan, Art Kaplan, the ethicist. And he was advising, you know, he was there during some of the early decision making. And I said, look, Art, what, what was that? What, why did we do, why, if you look at our pandemic policy from, 2018 you'll find none of the things we did what what was that he goes oh it was this it was panic it was panic and then he said and this is the thing i surmised from the beginning was that well if china hadn't done what they did we probably wouldn't have done it either what do you think about that um i, I used to think that was true i've actually come around to a somewhat different explanation um okay uh it's very clear that for close to 20 years um there was an infrastructure growing around, um, you know, what was called emerging infectious diseases. So, uh, you know, it, during the Cold War, there was, you know, a fear of biological warfare, right? Smallpox and other, mm -hmm. you know, biological diseases. And, and in the 70s, we and the Soviets reached an agreement not to, uh, you know, not to uh, study this stuff because um, uh, it was too dangerous. And, and, you know, we basically stuck to that, sort of. The Soviets didn't really stick to it at all. Okay. The Cold War ends. The 90s are great. You know, the biggest problem we have is the president and Monica Lewinsky. Um, and then there's the anthrax attacks. Uh, and 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 suddenly everybody or at least some people in the in the medical sort of biomedical warfare establishment are thinking about these diseases again. Um, but the problem was there wasn't quite enough there. So so they they decided that we needed to frighten people about the you know the idea of a super flu of an h1n1 of so, you know something that was going to be a real problem going forward and you see these and and and, and actually rfk jr's book um and there's a lot in it i like there's some things i don't like i mean he's certainly more conspiratorial than 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 i am but he does go into great detail about these sort of tabletop exercises that were run and there's books like the cobra event written there's a lot of time devoted to this is a real risk. We need to be afraid of this. We need to plan for this. We need a we need a stockpile for this. And, and you know, and, and and there was there was there was SARS one in two thousand three. There was uh, swine flu in 05, or bird flu in 05, H one N one in 09, swine flu in two thousand twelve, MERS in two thousand fourteen, Ebola in two thousand fourteen and fifteen. All this stuff gets a tremendous amount of attention. There's only one problem. None of it actually turns out to be that dangerous, right? The, it turns out 
that the biggest infectious disease epidemic in the last 75 years had nothing to do with respiratory or easily transmitted illnesses. It was HIV and AIDS, which sort of came out of nowhere. Right. There's been nothing right. you know, remotely societally changing since the 1918 Spanish flu. Okay, so these people, but there's an infrastructure out there that's trying to tell you this is a threat. And at the center of that infrastructure, mm -hmm. Fauci's in it, but really at the center of it is a guy named Peter Daszak. OK, and, and mm. but, you know, Johns Hopkins is there and none of this is secret. This is not really a conspiracy in any meaningful way because mm -hmm. they're doing this openly. They're trying to convince policymakers you need to spend a lot of money on this. And Dazak. But the problem is they every time they say something terrible is going to happen, it doesn't happen. And you can see them starting to get a little bit desperate and they start to they start to say, you know what, we're going to find we're going to go a step further. Than, than responding to pandemics or pandemic, you know, potential viruses as they happen. We're going to go find the ones that are dangerous. And my joke about this, although it's not really a joke, is so many bad assholes. So they like they literally <laughs> like they go into these caves in China and start swabbing bat assholes for viruses. And they like and, and they're <laughs> going to find out which one's the most. I'm not joking. This happened. OK, I believe and you. So I believe much you. Time, so many bad assholes. And so. So, uh, so, so, but even then they don't get what they want. So what do they say? They say, we're going to figure out how this can become more dangerous. We're going to do gain of function research to see how these things might theoretically recombine and become more dangerous. And, and they also, they sort of tie it into climate change. You know, the, the, we're, we're deforesting the Amazon. This is risky. What's ironic is, look, China has been settled for thousands and thousands of years. People have sort of lived in community with these bats for thousands of years and there's never been a problem the problem came when these idiot scientists started going to caves to look for the viruses well guess what like ultimately at the end of 2019 something happened okay and probably what happened is all these schmucks like playing around trying to make things worse actually came up with a dangerous virus and then walked out of the lab with it. Now, I'm not, again, that's not saying like they did it on purpose exactly. It's just saying they there, there was a group of people who kind of wanted this to happen. Not again, not because they wanted to depopulate the world or anything like that. They they've just been predicting it for so long. At some point, it's embarrassing if it doesn't happen. Well, guess what? It happened. And what had they been saying? They've been rewriting quietly the playbook of how we're gonna deal with this. That's the other thing that happened. So starting in 2005, 2006, the CDC uh, you know, and, 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 and sits down and rewrites the playbook to make it easier and more likely that we're gonna close schools, that we're gonna shut down. And one of the guys who did that then went to, off to found something called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness. Um, and, you know, and the others all sort of stayed in government. So guess what? When this happened, at the beginning of 2020, they knew exactly what they wanted to do. They'd been talking about doing it for 20 years, and they finally had a, an epidemic worthy of doing it, and they went ahead and did it. And so, I mean, one of the reasons I think that Fauci, you know, is so reluctant to have Wuhan, uh, uh, you know, sort of explored is that once you start to see, you know, the, the scope, it's, this, again, this isn't, this isn't exactly the same thing. It's not the same thing as saying, you know, a bunch of guys did this because they wanted to depopulate the world. This is sort of natural human incentive and stupidity leading right. to a place right. that we all like, or that was predictably bad. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. However, it, it wasn't U.S. pandemic response policy yet, correct? This was just a group of pandemic academics no, but they, so were, to speak. they were they were influential in driving the, the the people who were who were sort of panicking on the inside in january and february were the same people there's a guy named carter melcher again this guy at seppi named richard i think his last name is hatchet um Dazak, they all they all were very aware of this risk why were they so aware of this risk because they've been because they've been talking about it for 20 years and Dazak had gone further than that. He'd gone to the extent of trying to prove that it was a real risk. And then, you know, when, again, when he couldn't find a virus in nature that looked risky enough, he and a few other people like a guy named Ralph Barrack at, uh, at UNC, they, uh, you know, they, they, they worked to, to, to make these viruses riskier in the lab. So, 
So they were not quite, you know, they weren't inside the White House, but they were close enough to be able to sort of push the panic button or or help Donald Trump and help, you know, the people inside the White House push the panic button. And so were were there stated policies amongst the coalition for epidemic preparedness? In other words, the, this idea of massive shutdown and school closures seemed so new, so something no one had ever contemplated before Wuhan. Did they have that as their stated in, in policy um, so response or closures, did they get spun into their own web? I th- school closures, yes, but it was supposed to be for a limited time, four to 12 weeks. Uh, and then right. Carter Melcher said, oh, we got to close universities too. You know, uh, look at the density, you know, it, you look at the density in workplaces. Um, it, I, I would say, I would say they had, they, 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 you know, sort of in their fantasy world, they thought this is what we need to do but the United States, you know, won't go along with it. So the CDC, the, the big paper that was written in 06 and then updated in 2000, I believe, 17, never contemplated society-wide lockdowns, did contemplate school closures, did contemplate some remote work, but then two things happened. So so you sort of have this, you know, this, this infrastructure quietly being built to do this, and then two things happen. The, the virus jumps out in China and it does scare people, right? It, it looks really bad. It looks like three or 4% of people are dying and people are dropping dead in the streets, all this stuff that was not true. And at the same time, um, not only does China shut down, well, China's an authoritarian nation, Italy shuts down. And Italy, you know, Italy barely right. has a government at the time. So, you know, if right. the Italians can do it, well, well then, I, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I'm joking, but I'm not really joking. If the Italians can do it, well, then the rest of Western Europe and the United States can do it. And so- they, I, you know, I don't know what they thought the end game was, I guess. I, I mean, at some point, actually, very early on, it should have been clear to everybody that this was a massive overreaction. And that I mean, and that's really what pandemia yes. is about. That Really, by yes. by by late April 2020, it should have been clear that this was a massive overreaction. And yet they had sort of driven yes. themselves into this ditch and they couldn't get out. And then something else happened, uh, Dr. Drew, which is a that they all basically started waiting for the vaccines. And this is, again, this is where it gets weird. It's like not exactly a conspiracy, but pre-2020, there was a clear focus on mRNA vaccines. The, you know, Again, in these tabletop exercises, these games that they played, the solution was we're going to have an effective vaccine. And so, and so you know, within days, literally days of the news coming out of China, of this virus and of it being sequenced, they were preparing to get an mRNA vaccine on the go. This was gonna be their moment to demonstrate how good this technology was and how well it could work. And so, you know, as 2020 is progressing, there's this fight, there's politics, there's, you know, there's, there's lockdowns, there's school closures, but in the background is this vaccine aircraft carrier moving forward. And, you know, you can see them start to get, they're starting to get more confident in, you know, in, in, in August, in September, and then boom, you know, in, in, in November, you get these incredible top line results. And this is, this is how the game had gone, right? This is how the scenario had gone. We are the heroes, you know, like we public health people figured this out for you. We shut down the world and now we have a solution and it's all going to be behind us. No one has to be afraid anymore. There was only one problem, Mm -hmm. which was that after about, Four months after the second dose, these vaccines collapse in effectiveness. Right, right. And and do we do you have any <laughs> that, opinion that about they the, did the not booster? Count on. That was not part of the war. No, game they did exercise. not. No, right. Uh, but 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 here's the thing. I I I get what you mean by this momentum that develops around things. I, I you know as a clinician, you know that viral outbreaks are solved with vaccine that's how we solve them <laughs> and so to, to change that look at that view of reality would take a lot you understand now i understand this yes. is new technology and it's I, I understand all the controversies around it but but fundamentally those of us that are clinicians look at that and go well that's how we solve this problem or we dig into our hiv uh playbook and we try to come up with some therapeutics do you have any concerns about how that's going well, it's very, very, very interesting. You, 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 you mentioned that dichotomy because the smartest, one of the smartest doctors I know, and I really want to get him on the record and, and do a Q and A with him uh, for my Substack, 
um, uh, said to me, go back. And this, this guy's an HIV guy, like, and, you know, from, from, mm-hmm. from the beginning, you know, so from the eighties yeah. and all, you know, he knows Fauci, all those Redfield and Burks and, and, you know, and then sort of like HIV community, a lot of them are still around and uh, yep. you know, they're, they're all kind of at the top of the, of the, of the heap right now. But so, so what he said to me mm-hmm. is, you know, Fauci, the people who are the conspiracy theorists say, Oh, Tony Fauci killed people with AZT. He said, that's not true. You know, we were just desperate back then. It was, you know, HIV was terrible. It was yes. killing everybody. We were, we were just trying. That's he right. said the real, I, I was Fauci, just, you know, I was there. I was, I was in the room when we opened the first boxes of AZT. And you cannot imagine the excitement and the, and the relief that we could do something for the patients right? that were dying. Like, you can't believe how they were dying. So, but, yes, I mean, that was a young moment. men, right? They're healthy. They're, they're healthy one day and six months later, they're dead, right? I mean, people forget. Without exception. With, without right? exception. Without exception. I mean, it, it was, was not like, H- oh, we could, HIV. it was six months to live. Yep. Right. I mean, untreated HIV is the most dangerous uh, virus in human history. It, it actually is. Like, yep. so, yep. so, so, um, so what, what he said to me was from 82 through 87, Fauci made a huge mistake. His mistake was basically, I'm going to focus on vaccines and I'm going to focus on bucking up the immune system. And, and, the, mm-hmm. and, the, and the, um, the activists were saying to him, hey, Tony, we weren't sick before we got this. The problem is not our immune systems. The problem is the virus. Go get some antiretrovirals and save us. And um, right. and so and so finally in 19, 1987. Somebody else needs saving. Uh, Somebody else you got to save. That's Quick. right. That's right. Sorry about that. Um, in, right. in 1987, Fauci finally listened, and you know it took a few years and it took a lot of work. But by 1996, there were antiretrovirals that worked. And they destroyed mm-hmm. HIV. And to this day, there's not an, ex- an effective vaccine for HIV. There's antiretrovirals. Right. So this guy said to me, right. look at the Pfizer drug, not the, not the vaccine. Look at the drug. It actually looks really good. Yep. And it's what's going to end yep. COVID, not the vaccines. And just like he did in I the agree. 80s, Fauci made a mistake. That may, that's interesting. And, and I could see how you could make that mistake. I, I would argue, though, that we never we need, need everything we got. The question is, how much of a downside is there going to be from the vaccine? And with all this vaccine mania and the mandates around vaccine, how much trouble is the government going to get into with that? But that's a set or and how much are we going to taint other vaccine therapies if we overreach here? That's my concern. But on the on the yeah, side I, of I, the Paxlovid, so so molnupiravir, we're supposed to know about any minute now, God willing, we'll hear something about that. But that one's not nearly as effective as the Paxlovid. Why are they not no, rushing not, and, that and, out? You know, a, what is a, the? It's a mutagen. Like that that Merck drug is a little iffy. maybe 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 maybe. But I mean, people bring that up, and, and it's like there's really no evidence that. But okay, I, I personally, if I got exposed to COVID, I, I would take molnupiravir. Personally, I would. Uh, but be that as it may. Paxlovid is the thing that's going to make the difference. Why are they not yes. rushing that out the way they rushed out the vaccines? Yes. Well, I mean, that's a great question. So I think the uh, the the numbers came out or the, the clinical trial was stopped early. Was it four weeks ago? I mean, he, here's what I'd say. If they don't get it out by the end of the year, you can legitimately ask that question, I would say. I mean, it, right. it's, it's okay. also very clear they rushed the vaccine. Here, Here's the thing. The vaccines yeah. have... Uh, you know, at first I thought the vaccine may, the main problem with the vaccines was political. In other words, you, you really shouldn't be, you know, infringing on my right to choose whether or not to be vaccinated. It's really not, it's right. a, you know, it's a giant that's infringement right. over a disease that's relatively, uh, you know, relatively not risky to most people. And, 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 and I'm not saying, but by the way, and you're seeing, that? you're seeing young people, you're seeing young people across Europe raise that issue to, with their government. I was in France a few weeks ago and it was unreal how the youth had raised, rised up. Uh, they really felt it was an, a, it was an, they, they brought up the 1790s every time I talked to them as That's how much so the government has overreached its found. Yeah. They, they were overreaching their foundational principles from the revolution. That's really where they all went. Right. Young people. But, but, but here's what I'll say. I mean, I, and I totally think that's a huge problem, you know, in Europe and the U.S., places with, a, you know, traditions of individual liberty. I now am worried that there's a medical problem also, okay? I mean, actually, two medical problems, mm-hmm. two broad medical problems. The first mm-hmm. is that the vaccines clearly yeah. 
um, you know, do not work after a few months to prevent infection or transmission. They may work for to prevent severe disease, uh, you know, past okay. those few months, right. but it's not it's not entirely okay. clear. But but here's the second problem. I, the, the, no one is talking about this, Dr. Drew. There is isn't been an increase, um, a synchronized increase in all cause mortality, not including COVID deaths in across many European countries, uh, across uh, across many, okay. you know, uh, yeah. much of the United States and even across New Zealand. And by the way, this doesn't mean I'm not talking about like people dropping dead in the streets. I'm not talking about a doubling or tripling of deaths, but I'm talking about. There, there, there's, you know, there's a substantial, like above normal death count right yeah. now happening right. so, on a weekly so basis. Let me, let me, I, and we don't know why. Yes, so let me we put, I why. put it on a, it's a graph. Well, uh, Caleb, put the graph up. I, I actually sent it to Caleb to put up on the screen. I don't know if you can see it, but I'm sure it's what you're talking about. This yes. is the data, right? There, there it is. So I look at yes. that data and I go, well, that is only controlled for age. Right. That's the only thing they controlled for. That's right. And so in the group that's dying, here's what I here's what we know. Here's what I can tell you anecdotally. People are dying because they didn't get their health screening. They're coming in with more advanced cancers. They're dying of heart disease because they're not coming in for symptomatology because they're afraid of COVID. There is no doubt sure. that people with medical problems are more likely to die now because of not COVID, but the hysteria and the lockdown. So. So, right. So, by the way, that gra that graph has been criticized. I, I don't want to go into the details of it. The data around this is is much broader than that one graph. But but that that graph has gotten attention because it's a very easy way to visualize this sort of potential yeah. problem. I, I'm not disagreeing yeah. with you that that is one explanation for this, one possible explanation. And, and, for and this. let me let me what add I'm one other. Is, let me add one other, which yes. is which is that people with medical problems more likely to get vaccinated. That's also been my experience. So, so it's um, so it's more likely to have underlying stuff running for the vaccine, more likely to have not gotten proper care to to deal with the underlying medical issues or the burgeoning medical issues. And we know we know for sure that people are dying at a higher rate right now because of delayed medical treatment. For sure, that's happening. Yes. And now, why so, that sorts so, out between vaccinated and unvaccinated is not clear with that with that particular data. But go ahead. No, I I I, I agree. I agree that there are several potential explanations for this. My point about this has only been: we need to talk about this. The health authorities need to yeah. look at this, and 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 we yeah. need to be sure that this is in no way related to the mra vaccine, mRNA vaccines. We agree. We, but, agree. And certainly, agree. before we encourage people to get boosters. That's what we should be doing, but we're not really doing it. Anybody who raises any questions, and forget about side effects, just about basic vaccine efficacy. I mean, I got banned from Twitter for that, Dr. Drew. You know, I'm on my sub stack and I, well, I was gonna say coming out, but, but I've been censored. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yes. And now and now, right, these last two topics have been the Alex Berenson we've come to know and love. And so, so this is this, <laughs> is, this, is, this is you. Yeah, right. This is you getting my my strike on YouTube. So it's good. <laughs> so uh, but yeah, this is where you have created um, noise, which is you're just raising issues. And what, what I've always appreciated is that you don't mind being wrong. You just want some you just want to raise these things. Have you have you looked at Monica Gandhi's threads? Have you seen her uh, stuff? Yeah. You know, it's funny you mention her and, because in in pandemia, I I refer I say there are COVID leftists, there are COVID rightists, and there are COVID centrists, which sometimes consists of only one person, Monica Gandhi, because yeah. because she <laughs> right, obviously right. Well, does I, try I, to try to walk a line. Yeah, yeah, I'm there with her, just so you know. So you you can put me <laughs> like in that camp because I I spent half my day retweeting her stuff because I find her stuff <laughs> just spot on most of the time. But so, the, but there are people that are that are in academia that have substantial, po you know, sort of position in in the infectious disease world, who are trying to raise these things in in a, in a sort of careful way, and and uh, so it's I, not like I it's not academia, being raised. It's that it's that. It, no, I think the problem is though, if you raise anything even slightly more provocative than what she's doing outside in in the public space, meaning in media, in social media, you're screwed. You're going to get crushed. Yes. And, and and by the way, that's true in the academic journals, too. You can see it in how carefully the papers are written that, you know, you'll see a paper and it'll be about, you know, myocarditis in kids following vaccination and four sentences in there'll be this sort of stock line. We know the mRNA vaccines are safe and effective. 
and, you know, should be used by everybody in their drinking water. By the way, here were our <laughs> findings, which are terrible. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's concerning. It, it is. It, I I worry again. It's not concerning. I'm not worried about somebody who elects to have their kid vaccinated. I'm worried about mandates. I, I'm worried about you, what yes. that's going to mean when you take three healthy nine year olds and they get serious myocarditis or pericarditis. What, what how that's going to be perceived? That's going to be a thing. That's going to be something to reckon with. I think. And so well, I would the, urge but their us, answer to the way to avoid to try that to prevent people from talking about it. I mean, that's what they've done. They try I, I, to well, prevent it. Talking. Yeah, I, I know, yeah, we know. And, and and we know we're we're part of that, and it's really a hard thing to to deal with. It's never I've never seen anything like it. Uh, forget in medicine, in, in science. I mean, it's such a weird thing not to be, con, you know, dialoguing all the time and trying to get closer to the truth as best we can. Well, you're fearful of losing your license. You have, you know, you can. You <laughs> well, now they're encumbering people's licenses. They're encumbering everything. But, but it's, but it's hard. To, listen, I'm, I'm, I've been. Well, we've been all vaccinated and boosted, and I'm all for it. I, I am in that camp. But I still wouldn't tell if when somebody sits down with me to make a decision about getting vaccinated, it's not perfunctory. It's a, it's a risk reward analysis that I make with the patient that depends on their age, their medical status, their motivation, a lot of things. It's not. I don't, I don't ever any medical treatment. Just go. Just do it. We don't have to talk to you about it. Just do it. There's there's no such <laughs> thing in medicine. And to me, this this is what's so disturbing that that people have the most disturbing thing of all for me, Alex, is that people feel that they should be involved in the decision making between a patient and a doctor. That is the most bizarre mm -hmm. thing I've ever seen. Well, uh, imagine it was between a, a, a attorney and a client. Can you imagine the hue and cry? That that's a great point. That's a great way to look at it. Um, uh, I mean, and I, but I think there's, there's so many problems. Yet another problem with this is now that they have, you know, they, they, they have encouraged so many people quasi forced in some cases, people to get vaccinated, discourage doctors from having the kind of conversations you're talking about. Now they're all in. If there is some problem with these vaccines that, you know, even if it's relatively minor, uh, it, it looks terrible for them. And so their response has been, we're not going to discuss it. Uh, and, and, and so mm. he, you know, and, and God forbid there, there's a, you know, there's a significant problem with them that only comes out over time. And here, you know, Dr. Drew, here's right. what, uh, you know, and I, and I think I mentioned, yeah, I, I think I do explicitly say this in pandemia is that the, the belief was uh, in the FDA and the NIH and, you know, and, and I think in the companies too, well, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's two doses of this, of this vaccine. And there's never been a vaccine in history that didn't, that if, if there were no side effects after 42 days after the second dose, there were no side effects. So in other words, right, we don't right. have to worry about some downstream thing that we weren't counting on to happen. And so we can move this right. through pretty fast. Mm -hmm. I think what they didn't think about was the fact they're using a completely different technology than all other vaccines. And, and they should have respected that and spent more time, uh, you know, making sure that there wasn't some tail risk. And, and, and again, like, I, I know you're not overly concerned. I know you, you know, you say, obviously you've been vaccinated. Many, many, many mm -hmm. people in this country and worldwide have been vaccinated. People are, you know, most people, you know, have not had severe side effects, but that doesn't mean that there's not some tail risk that we that's you know, right. should have known no, about right. and don't know about. That's right. And, and should be, should be, um, respectful of that every time we make a decision on behalf of a patient. Uh, yes. I, I maybe I don't understand public health decision making, but their decision making has been just mystifying <laughs> to me this whole time. And, and and one of them, you mentioned the HIV community. One of them, the the as you say, I I, I cut my teeth on AIDS. That's where I was in training during that pandemic. We were. I mean, it was unbelievable. As a third-year medical student, I was sitting patients down routinely and telling them they had six months to live, and I was never wrong. Third-year medical student. And then as time went on, I was treating all the terrible infections and tumors. I mean, these are these lymphomas would literally cut my patients in half. They'd have these burkets that would tear through. It was just un... You can't even imagine how horrible this was. And and we got it. We figured it out. We pushed it forward, and we figured therapeutics. And and I and I knew we would do that with this one too. I knew we would come up that this medical system would be the one. You know, we never measure that in our assessments of the medical system in the United States. It's always infant mortality and blah 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 blah. No, 
when it comes to improvising and responding, responding with therapeutics, no, nobody comes close to what we do. And so I, I knew we would, yes. we would, we were, no, we're not Italy. And so for us to behave like Italy was just, again, so weird to me. So I want to go back to the 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 so-called non-pharmacological interventions. First of all, you mentioned the HIV community. Now, one of the things that came out of the HIV community, of which I was sort of a part of early on, was the way to message the population at large in order to change their behavior. It's we we learned categorically it is not by shaming or bullying or calling stupid or sitting in a box and you know mandating from on high we learned it was story relatable sources cases where you could see the consequences of bad choices and then humor and music we learned that there was no doubt it was like categorically that's how we did it that's how we changed the behavior is by going out and showing them stories about people movies television shows all kinds of things about what happens if you if you if you don't make some better choices we abandoned that completely and went in the other direction in this pandemic and i it feels like that's connected to the coalition for epidemic preparedness somehow because it's so far uh, all, it, what it, they it, recommended and what they did were so far from really what we knew to be good policy um, no, I, I agree with that. And, you know, and this I do go into in pandemia, um, uh, you know, in some like, I mean, one of the things about the book is the book's, you know, 400 pages long and has 800 footnotes, but it could be twice as long, uh, honestly. And, um, and, you know, and I wish I had more time to talk about this sort of clear psychological campaign that the, um, you know, that, that governments ran in this coordinated fashion. And, some of this, you know, some of this has come out. There's been documents that have come out of Germany, and documents that have come out of the UK, where it's clear that they, that these, that these, uh, these government agencies, um, these public health agencies, were afraid that people who were young were not going to listen, and 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 mm. because they, because people who are young are not at very high risk from COVID most of the time. Now, again, there can always be exceptions, but for the most part, they're not at very high risk from COVID, and so. There's a document from Britain in, in March 2020, that, you know, a government document where they say we need to make, we need to basically we need to frighten people who are at low risk from this. And, you know, we need to, we, and we even need to consider shaming them. And I mean, I think. Where, I think did, that, where did that come from? What, what, where did that come from? Who was that? Where well, did it that start? I mean, to, to give them to give them the benefit of the doubt, which I which at this point I don't believe they deserve, but to give them the benefit of the doubt, what you'd say is, well, society, you know, this is a really dangerous, um, uh, you know, pathogen overall. Even if it isn't dangerous to some young people, we just have to lock down for a while, and to do that, we need societal buy-in, and to do that, we need to scare people. And I mean, uh, look, that was a hard, as you said, it's a horrible strategy. It's the wrong strategy, and it's had terrible effects uh you know for the last 18 months and they're only getting worse in my opinion because the health authorities refuse to acknowledge the mistake they made and so you have this population that just doesn't like uh you know uh, doesn't like being told what to do anymore um and isn't right. gonna listen but uh but right but I, I guess that was their strategy i mean i guess that was their reason we know it was their strategy it, but it, but it was so so hysterical and so uh, disproportionate to the circumstance. W did they believe that something much much worse was going to happen? That's on one hand, I'm imagining that's what they thought on some level that something much more serious was afoot here. That the only thing that explains it to me why why the hysterics otherwise? So number one, they're in a panic because they misjudged the seriousness. Now we all misjudged it. To be fair, I thought it was less serious. They thought it was more serious. Okay, but it became super clear that the lockdown was was a temporizing measure. It was never meant to be a treatment or a way of preventing or these ideas of zero COVID and locking down every time things start breaking out. How did we get into that cycle? Uh, you know, I, did it become almost a competition? I mean, you can see evidence for that in some countries. When you see, 
you know, uh, in New Zealand that the, you know, that the, that the government, you know, rides to victory last year on a zero COVID plan. And, you know, we've kept COVID out of the country. And, you know, I have my wife's relatives, they live in Newfoundland and, uh, you know, Canada has had relatively low cases compared to the United States. And they're so proud of their lack of, you know, a relative lack of COVID deaths. It's like nothing else matters. And, you know, I, I don't, I mean, it's a bizarre way to look at the world, but, the, but you know, people have adopted this in Western countries. And, you know, if, I honestly, thank God in the United States we're a little bit more surly and, you know, we have some people who don't like to be told what to do. And, you know, we have a sort of like pretty rivalrous political system. And so we, you know, it hasn't gone down as easy here. I mean, my, my joke, and it's not really a joke, is we have 10 amendments and all of them matter in the United States. I mean, obviously we have more than 10 amendments, but we have 10 amendments in the Bill of Rights yeah. and all of them matter. And so, uh, and so, you know, but in other, in other advanced democracies, there's been, a, a, and I don't know if it's because it's a personal misunderstanding of fear, uh, you know, a personal misunderstanding of the risk. I don't know. I mean, you, you know, you can be really cynical and say it's a lot of people who liked getting unemployment checks and not having to leave their house. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but but this has been embraced by people in a way that's really, frankly, disappointing to me, uh, you know, as a as of someone who thinks of himself as a free citizen. It is weird, isn't it? That, that's part, that, you're, you're sort of zeroing in on something that I thought was so weird about the pandemic is the people that wanted to tell you what to do and were advocating you do very strange things, and then the people that wanted to be told what to do and then to comply as carefully as possible with it when it was so clearly concerning what they were... I, I, to me, it's just mystifying to want to be told what to do and then to want to tell other people how to live their lives. I mean, it, particularly when it... Again, there's just no evidence for it. I, I, I'm... I, that's the part that I'm still struggling with. So, so you could look at the o Omicron outbreak, right? So we have a virus. Yep. You could pick any of the variants up until Omicron and have the exact same level of panic about it if you wanted to. But they chose this one to have a panic about because it had more mutations. So they could go ahead and have their panic. You you sort of see the how this everything works because the, the media loves it. They go crazy with it. The government declares emergencies it's it's sort of weird well or 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 dr drew they picked this one to panic about because the booster uh campaign is falling flat and because the 5 to 11 vaccination campaign is falling flat and because uh you know the cms mandate got you know got uh an injunction issued against it today and the OSHA mandate got essentially struck down even before it took effect a couple of weeks ago. And Joe Biden doesn't know what to do. And so he's happy as anything to have uh, Omicron to, you know, to to. And by the way, the vaccines are failing. So now they can blame uh, this variant. By the way, the South Africans who, you know, who are seeing Omicron more than anybody, you know, who saw more than anybody else last month or, you know, yeah. for the last uh, yeah. two to three weeks say it's very mild. They say it's very transmissible and very mild, which is sort of exactly, you know, the way vaccines are so, or, or viruses are supposed to evolve. And so there's no mm -hmm. evidence at this point that this thing's actually dangerous. It may be dangerous. OK, we may find out in a month. But as right. you just said, the That's panic right. has far outrun anything we know about this. And it is hard. And, and again, I've gotten so cynical about public health and about these governments, it's hard to see it as anything but an effort to try to scare people who, you know, who are done with this to, to you know, to agree to a booster shot. That, you know, so it's funny. I, I look at it as, well, one good thing may come out of this. The, the vaccine and the booster resistant may go get their shots. So to me, it's a positive. <laughs> and, and you see it as a, as a reason for, for concern that they're doing it in order to which almost is justified in my head, although I don't like anybody <laughs> using fear and intimidation for anything. See, you're uh, so falling really into the trap again. It, well, no, it's interesting. We're, we're just, it's, it's interesting how when you change perspective, it has, you have a different way of looking at it. Because again, I try to sit in the middle here, and I, I, and I am. I, I, I don't know which is the right perspective. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I am definitely a vaccine advocate, and as such, 
something that moves people in that direction, I can look at as a net positive, even though I'm very unhappy with how this thing is progressing. And, and you know, and, and so that's really kind of the fear of it is that there's so much change in the spike protein that, and the uh, binding domain that they're concerned that it could, you know, uh, get around the vaccines. And, and it could, but it's not likely. And if it's so mild, then why are they and telling mild, people to get vaccinated? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I'm with you. And if it's mild, it could be its own vaccination, right? I mean, it could be you get a cold and now you've got natural immunity against COVID. It could be a net positive thing. <sighs> yes. I, look, um, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't want to go. I have to go. Um, uh, I know we're supposed to do it six to seven and like, unfortunately it's technical difficulties. It's okay. Um, I, yeah. I will gladly come back with you, uh, either later in the week or next week. Cause I know there's a lot of people who have a lot okay. of questions. Um, I, but, yeah. uh, yeah, for sure. but yeah. you know, I feel like we've Thursday. just scratched the surface <laughs> right now. Yeah, I agree. And I want to read your book. I can't wait. I think a lot of people need to read it because I because it, it sounds like it's a very dispassionate look and it's it's bringing up the kinds of forces that brought these extraordinary circumstances into 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 in our lives. I, I still think that China doing what it did. Let me just one last point before I let you go. My when I saw China do what it did, it looked to me like a rehearsed procedure that they had in place should something get out of their local lab. Like this, they roll, they roll the trucks down the street. It looked rehearsed. Where did those trucks come from? Where did they get those ideas from? It looked to me like a policy that the local communist leader had to, to actualize to prevent getting in trouble with the leadership further upstream. It looked rehearsed. And, the, and, the, and it was a response to a, a, a laboratory outbreak, it seemed to me. Yeah, it took us a while to clean up the subway. And, and an attempt to save face <laughs> and to hide the outbreak. And the fact that we adopted that as a pandemic policy, to me, was the part that was so ill ill fated because it it's not what it was designed for but again we have a lot more to talk about in terms of how we should design a pandemic policy i, I imagine you get into that in pandemia as well uh, um you know a little bit it's really a, i mean my policy on this would have been essentially you know stand up the hospitals and not do much else and you know not try to scare people you know if there's regionalized or localized outbreaks that are really bad maybe you, sh you shut the yeah you know you shut the bars yeah. and you shut arenas for a few days but basically mm -hmm. um once we saw uh you know that this that this really wasn't uh you know the 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 the, 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 the you know the, the death rate was more on the uh, the level of three or two totally. or three per thousand yeah. than, you know, three yeah. or four per hundred, we should have, we should have changed course immediately. Um, uh, you know, but it's, a, it's an interesting point you make about China. Why did they respond? You know, I will say this, China, you know, they, they're very, they're very good at putting people in internment camps. They've done that with the, you know, with the Uyghurs for, uh, for, for yeah. a decade yeah. or more. So, you know, they, they're not afraid yeah. to clamp down and that may have been why their response was so quick. But, but you make a good point. They certainly were in a hurry to do it. And it certainly did look, um, you know, I, I rehearsed. I don't know if that's the word I'd use, but it, but it was but it was very aggressive. That's for sure. It was immediate. It, it, where, I, to me, the image that will, I'll never get over were the trucks rolling down the street, squirting chlorine all over the place. Where did that come yes. from within 24 hours, unless they were sitting in a garage waiting for a problem? You know what I'm saying? Yes. Where did that come from? Those kinds of things. Yes. No, let me, let me throw, uh, you know, one last thing. I, I can't get off the phone because it's so interesting. I, but, um, you know, go back and look at Contagion. Okay. And people, they, people, the people on Twitter who hate me, they love to compare me to the Jude Law character in Contagion, which is, which is really funny because I'm not selling any false hope at all. Right. It's, I'm actually the opposite of that. I'm just, I'm saying like, we basically have to sort of weather our way through this. But if you look at Contagion even, so that's 2009, there were many of the same sort of people who were, who were you know, helping design the pandemic response actually consulted with Soderbergh on that movie. You know, it's, it's the flu that comes out of China. I mean, this has been, there's been an effort to get people thinking about this slash scared about this for, uh, you know, for 20 years now. And, uh, and again, it's so interesting that like everything that they wanted to do, they got the chance to do. And, 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 and by the way, the, you know, the, the, the kicker, the, you know, the twist in the story is that none of it works and that, you know, we're going to get to where we would have been if we hadn't have done any of it anyway. 
I, I want to just before I let you go, put, shine a bright light on that statement because that is the point: is that it it changed the time course, it didn't change the outcome, it didn't, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. And that's now, what need to protect is, hospital that's what beds. Is all about. Um, sorry, to say again. Well, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. Everyone should read it. I'll let you go as I promised I would, and we'll talk and, soon. Okay. And, and make sure you we'll call we'll Mr. Carroll. See you Thursday. <laughs> okay, maybe Thursday. Oh. We'll see. All right, Alex Barron. Thanks, everybody. guys. The book is called Pan. You got it, my friend. Pandemia is the uh, book. Take a look at it. Read it for yourself. Decide what you think. Um, again, it's it's interesting to me to talk to people who have differing points of view. I I'm obviously have a kind of a. It's it's funny. I, I see it from a different perspective, a different angle than he does, and yet we I agree on a lot of the the facts. But now it's more historical. I mean, it's not historical because we're historical. alive. No, it's you're not, right. Though, oh, we, I see Giving our saying. own interpretation, but it, it's in, it's through the it's not. It, Susan has a point that everyone has to die for everything to be historical. You have to so, be not alive so, for it to be historical. So we can never be historical. Well, that's but what my history teachers told I, me. I understand, but we can see things through the rearview mirror a little bit more. Clearly, no, but perhaps. we it. It's not going to be kind. The history is not going to be kind. I, I, it shouldn't be. Like it it really idiots. shouldn't be. I, I, it shouldn't be. All look, we all got taken with this virus. It's fine, and let's let's acknowledge well, it and go. But, yeah, we we, we called some things here's, wrong. I have I have sort of some ideas. Okay, so okay. Oh, can you hold them till after the break? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're gonna hear your calls, Susan's ideas after the break. Be right back. I want to give a shout out to our good friends at Blue Mics. If you've heard my voice on this show any time over the past year, including right now, you've been listening to Blue Microphones. And let me tell you, after more than 30 years in broadcasting, I don't think I've ever sounded better. But you don't need to be a pro or have a fancy studio to benefit from a quality mic. You may not realize it, but if you've been working from home or using Zoom to chat with friends, you probably spend a lot of time in front of a microphone. So why not sound your best? Whether you're doing video conferencing, podcasting, recording music, or hosting a talk show, Blue has you covered. From the USB series that plugs right into your computer to XLR professional mics like the mouse or the Blueberry we use in the studio right now. Bottom line, there's a Blue microphone to fit your budget and need. I can't say enough about Blue mics. And once you try one, you will never go back. Trust me. To take your audio to the next level, go to drdrew.com slash blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. In my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients Plus, each single serving easy pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy to pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink, it uses all natural flavors, gluten free, dairy free, caffeine free, non GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready to drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H Y D R A L Y T E dot com slash D R D R E W. Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew 25 for a special discount. I'm here with my daughter Paulina to share an exciting new project. Over the years, we've talked to a ton of young people about what they really want to know about relationships. It's difficult to know who you are and what you want, especially mm. as a teenager. And not everyone has access to an expert in their house like I did. Of course, it wasn't like I was always that receptive to that advice. Right, no kidding. But now we have written the book on consent. It is called It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward, and it explores relationships, romantic relationships, and sex. It's a great guide for teens, parents, and educators to go beyond the talk and have honest and meaningful conversations. It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward will be on sale September 21st. You can order your book anywhere books are sold. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, and of course, your independent local bookstore. Links are available on drdrew.com. So pre-ordering the book will help people, well, raise awareness, obviously, and it'll get that conversation going early so more people can can notice this and spread the word of positivity about healthy relationships. So if you can, we would love your support by pre-ordering now. Totally. And as we said before, this is a book that both teenagers and their parents should read. Read the book, have the conversation. It doesn't have to be awkward. On sale September 21st.
And we are back. We are no longer with Alex Berenson. We might be able to get him back on Thursday or maybe next Tuesday or something. I was like, can you come Thursday? Yeah, we need to figure out next week, too, which is a little bit ch choppy. Yeah, it's maybe, up in the air because of your travel. I will be going to New York this week. But let's go, do get, to, oh, Susan, you were going to bring your topics so up. So I'm yeah. a problem solver. Okay. You know, in, in times of, of pandemics and disasters. We like, call those moms. Yeah. I, no, I just, I've always been like this. Yeah. I've always been like this. But yeah. I get it after my dad. He was always good at fixing stuff. Yeah. But, you know, what I've seen the government not do and what we didn't do collectively is build a better medical system for people, for everybody. Now that we realize that if you get sick, you need to call somebody on the phone. And, you know, I'm trying to get a vet for my dogs. I can't get a vet. I, there's no such thing anymore after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I am, you have to wait eight hours at an ER and... And you have to, you know, it, it's sort of the same thing. I feel like, uh, I think like America's been let down with this horrible, horrible medical system that we've built. We scared the doctors. We didn't let them work together. We didn't let the collective consciousness of science come together and, and solve problems. Instead, we muted everybody and made them feel like a robot in there. But I would, their I would argue that the reason we were so crippled was the direction we are moving this healthcare system in the name of making a better, more integrated overall system. Cheaper or whatever. But like so, but so what would you do? Well, I'd make medicine more lucrative for people who are doctors, first of all. It's sort of like they're screwing them over, you, you mean know. The general doc the doctors yeah, that I mean, are doing it's like, medical. It's care. like teachers, you know, yeah. they don't they don't make enough money to really want to be a doctor anymore. We're not going to have good doctors. Nobody's going to want to because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, you're, it's painful. It, it's you're just li you're in a system, you know, yep. you're not practicing medicine and right. helping people. But I think also maybe with telemedicine and stuff like that, you know, that'll help. Um, we're all reaching out to each other, you know, we're learning about doctors that are out there via, you know, via the internet. So mm -hmm. that's the good news, but I just feel like the government should get behind that and help promote it, you know, and like I, I get phone calls, people are like, I, you know, I'm sick and I'm like, well, call your doctor. Well, it's Sunday. I go, well, there's always doctors on call. You can still call them if you're really sick. Yeah. No, I have to go to the ER. No, don't go no, to the, the ER. ER look, one, one is free. So one, once a doctor prescribes, here, here, people don't, uh, maybe the problem is an educational people don't system. Have doctors. <laughs> but maybe there's an educational system. Once a doctor picks up his or her prescription pad and opens it and gives you the prescription, that person is responsible from then on for your medical care until you either don't follow up after an extended period of time or you fire that person. Right. 24 seven, that person is responsible for you. If you call him, her, or the coverage, the cost to you is zero. Right. If you go to an emergency room, the cost to you is somewhere between $1,200 and $2,400. But there really doesn't seem to be enough doctors to go around, you know? Well, or, but they're using they're find. using nurse practitioners and physicians extenders and, and things like that. And that's the same thing. I mean, it's just, and I, and I feel, I think I really realized this when I, Rex got sick on Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and I went to my normal place, but they said I couldn't come in because some dog got hit by a car. Mm -hmm. And it's more like an emergency room now. So you have to sit in line and wait, depending on how how bad your your animal is, I mm -hmm. guess you get in line. And they made me they were gonna make me sit for six hours because yeah. he was throwing up for twenty four hours. That's and just I said, veterinary medicine. And I was like, Okay, this is my regular vet, but they're not even a vet anymore. They're now like socialized medicine. They're just ERs. get in line. Yeah. And so, so I was even thinking about, but right, it, I, I think it's applying to the human rights too. That's what I'm thinking. That we're becoming corporatized, or we're sort not. Of, people don't have primary caregivers. They don't have lives. relationships with their providers, or they don't have insurance too. But well, but, you know. So, but something. Oh, this is Caleb. it's it's unfortunate, but this is the truth. Is I remember whenever I was very sick and I was going through my surgeries and all mm -hmm. of that stuff. The absolute mm -hmm. best medical mm -hmm. care I've ever gotten in my life is because I was desperate and I paid for a concierge medicine doctor. I don't know, right. you're probably mm -hmm. familiar right. with that. It was on top of my insurance, yep. on top of my other fees, I had to pay an annual fee to have access just to see this doctor for the reason of he would reduce the amount of patients down to maybe like a 10th of what doctors normally see. Right. And I had amazing so like, care. But, but, it's so like so $2,000 a year. But hang on, I think most people would be surprised what that yearly amount is. It's like two grand. How much is uh, it? Yeah, it, it, I think it was, I think it was 2400 for the full year and it was it, okay, so it, it's a, it was it's a great fair, for when i needed it. It, it it seemed very fair it to is, me because i could health, get same day appointments 
but I was desperate and your I, health I, is worth I, it. Right. You know, people go, women go and get their nails done. They spend more money than that. They go get their eyelashes glued on. They get, you know, people spend money on a lot of things and they think, oh, well, this is, you know, because I love this and I need this. But $2,000 a year is not that much so it's, for uh, everybody. Right. Like, so it's, uh, it is a lot, but, but having but that's, that, but or you, you even get just also, having a general it's, practitioner. You get what you pay for. That doctor was amazing. When I when I had my fall after the surgery, I fell and hit my head. Mm -hmm. It was at two in the morning and my yeah. wife was calling 911. You probably remember this. Calling 911 in Los Angeles. They put her on hold and I'm passed out. I think right. I'm blind. I can't see anything. She calls my doctor. It immediately goes to his, his cell phone. He wakes up at 2 a.m. and walks her through what to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening is it's, it's I, I don't, right. people are expecting a certain level of, of, of care when the best doctors they're still out there, but you have to find them. You have to find them and you have to pay them, I'm glad pay them for their time. I'm glad they have concierge service now, though. Because, mm -hmm. like, Drew used to have patients that couldn't pay him and they'd bring him really nice Christmas gifts and stuff. But it's a nice it's a, it's a nice alternative for people that, you know, have health problems and need to have a, a doctor on call. Well, I mean, and I wish it wasn't that way. Like, I, well, I wish that it was possible to not have to be that way because most people can't afford it. And I know that I could barely afford it at that time, but it was worth it. In the end, it was worth it. the government it. gets behind helping people have personal doctors, promoting doctors, giving doctors more money to make a living so that there Incentives. are more doctors, giving them the opportunity. Well, the right to now, nobody's going to the primary care that you're talking about. Just no one's doing it. And so it, it's, it is, they're, they're really, look, it's being designed to be taken over by nurse practitioners and physician assistants, and they're very good. Right. And, the, and the, that is how you're going to, that's but how you it's have gonna, to be able to call in an emergency and not go to the ER. Right. Or the, that is we, true. We went to an urgent care the other day because we had to get a COVID test. And, you know, it was like, we're probably mixed in there with people who have COVID. Like we shouldn't be in there. It's, yep. it, it's not helping. All right. Let me take some calls and off uh, Clubhouse. Raise your hand if you'd like to come up and uh, give Anyways, a chat. Uh, <laughs> I will try to get to some of you here. Uh, we are going to get, I can, again, I can't see the names. It's their goal long travels. Uh, if you want to come up to the podium and you'll be streaming out on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, uh, YouTube, and uh, everywhere. <laughs> uh Goal long travels. Okay. <laughs> Not coming up. I'm going to try Sandeep Carr. Sandeep. Is that, there we yeah, are. Hey, Dr. Drew. Hi, how Sandeep. are you? Good. Excellent. How are you? Man, I have to say, back in the early 90s, I used to watch, uh, listen to you and Adam Carroll mm -hmm. on uh, Loveline. It was the best. Thank you. That was fun. He, muted you? You're, you're, he still has a he still has a you, podcast you, with you, Adam Corliss. Yeah, so yeah I still I still am three days a week with Adam. If you can get it at doctor.com, but you muted yourself. There you go. Go ahead, Sandy. Yeah, yeah, I did. But yeah, I mean, I I just loved it. I just want to say, I mean, this is a very interesting sort of uh, discussion. Uh, sorry, that's my dogs barking mm -hmm. in the background. We love but. That. Uh, really? Yeah, I apologize. I'm sorry. But uh, uh, they rule the house. Of course. But uh, Dr. Drew, what I was, uh, you know, I was very interested. I didn't know you were um, uh, part of the whole HIV stuff. Yeah, right? I was very involved with all that at the beginning. I'm very, in fact, I, I mean, any of us in training at the time, that's, we were seeing those patients by the thousands. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable. Yeah, it was awful. So, so I came of age during that time mm. uh, as well. I'm, I'm younger than you are. But, uh, yeah, I've heard stories about how awful it was. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I mean, when you think about the pandemic and stuff, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about, one of my buddies actually told me this. He said when the Spanish flu came over, um, you know, it ran through. For two years, for two years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Knocked off a whole bunch of folks. They didn't have a vaccine. They actually in, didn't even know that it was a virus, right? Right, because yep. they didn't have electron microscopes at that mm -hmm. time, right? So they they don't know what the hell it was, but you know the it went through, and then two years later it was okay. Now here we are, right? Mm -hmm. This is the second pandemic since then. 
uh, we have all of the technology at our fingertips. We have, you know, vaccines. We can look at the virus. They freaking decoded the genome of the virus, you know, January 30th, uh, 2020. Mm-hmm. Why are we still so, so messed up? You know, <laughs> why are we so afraid? Is that what you're asking? Or why are we, why do we not have it under control yet? Yeah, exactly. We're close. We really are so close. Uh, and it, you know, it, that, that 1918 flu, the other thing is it killed young people, routinely killed young people. And, and that made it more of a horror. Uh, the fact that we sacrificed young people to old people this time was you know, really kind of an, another choice I would get into Alex about is why they did that. You know, why, why they consciously sacrificed the schooling and well-being of young people to protect people whose life expectancy sometimes measured in months. It's a, it was a really weird decision making. And I, I think to, to, you know, to, it took us, you know, many years to get the HIV epidemic under control. Remember, I mean, I, the epidemic hit when I started medical school and we didn't have treatments, effective treatment until eight, 10 years later. Right. And, and that was the fastest in the history of medicine by orders of magnitude. It took us a thousand years to figure out what syphilis was. In a ye- in two years, we had characterized a new syndrome, figured out the causative agent. Two years later, understood the physiology and all the complications of the of the medical manifestations, and had treatments within five years, six years. Had five years. We had really good some treatments within five years, and that was nothing like that had ever happened in the history of medicine. And so the fact that we kind of come up with some pretty good stuff in two years here. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. The weird part I think you're bringing up is that we reacted so aggressively to it uh, before we came up with these treatments, that we were so affected by it. Uh, that's the part that's uh, a little bit uncanny. Uh, Brandy, I'm going to try to get her up to the, the podium here. Hi, Brandy. Hi, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to comment on two things. I'll start with this one since you just referenced it again how you were talking about the this whole scare tactic with the campaigns. Mm-hmm. I'm embarrassed to admit, you know, my whole life, I never had to worry about my vaccination status. Um, I knew that I had all of my vaccines. My, my parents made sure of that going mm-hmm. to school and things of that nature. But this whole scare tactic has now made me question vaccines moving forward. Well, it's, it's interesting if uh, Steve uh, Kirsch, who is a, a bio, you know, a, a you know, a, a brilliant dude that looked at the numbers and he, he was saying the same thing that he was somebody who just, you know, assumed everything was, you know, okay. But when he started looking under the hood, he, he's become a bit resistant. So yeah. it, it, I don't think he's right, but I can understand why people would get that way. I do. Yeah. And, and it's, it's something that I'm, you know, I'm str- I'm not, I don't want to accept it, you know, so mm-hmm. I, I am working on that, but I, I do want to believe that, you know, vaccines have their purpose. I know that mm-hmm. they do. But like you said, if there was just if they kept transparency and and just communicated and allowed people to say their thoughts, it's exactly uh, it. That is, if if they would tell you, like that's what I was asking Alex. You know, what was this? Well, why'd they do this? If they would come forward and go, you know what? Here's what was happening to us when we made these decisions. Here's why we made those decisions. I would feel very differently about this whole thing. I suspect because yeah. then because then a your your sort of rigidity and paranoia goes down, so you sort of start trusting people more. But secondly then you can sort of discuss the reasoning that went into it. Like, well, why'd you think that? And how'd you conclude that? And hmm, maybe I could see why you might've concluded that at the time, even though it turned out to be wrong. So why aren't you changing directions now? I mean, a a million questions we can have as opposed to this weird, you're just going to be silenced, which is un-American for lack of a better way of saying it. I I, I don't know that we've ever been like that. And it's not just in this country, to be fair. It's, It's in the Western world, people are behaving like this. Yeah. Wild. Well, um, be careful, and but don't get too resistant. I mean, talk, get a good relationship with a doctor. Get that doctor to work with you. Have he or she make those decisions with you. That That's how you do this. Somebody who really has clinical judgment and has been working in the system for a long time and understands how to interpret you know, some of these excesses and really where it looks like something that's in your best interest, given your particular clinical circumstance. That's what this I'm is. I'm worried that there aren't many, and it's hard to find, you know? Good doctors. Yeah, like yeah. the vet. Like yeah. now, it's just a you know a revolving door of of doctors, and I know you can't get your own personal doctor. I mean, you have we got we got lucky because we got in under the radar. You know. Hey, Joe. Hey, Doctor Drew. How uh, you feeling? I hope you and 
Susan had a very happy Thanksgiving we as well did. as Caleb. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, I'm doing okay. You know, things have been, you know, things have been better. Mm. I mean, you know, I'm working on cognitive behavioral therapy. Oh, good. Um, you know, uh, because if there's anyone living under a rock, and by now I've said it enough on Twitter, it's me. Mm. Um, because of, of course, you know, let me bring it up again, because of chronic ITP. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fact that there are now nearly three dozen papers showing those with thrombocytopenia having bad results with vaccination, mm -hmm. much less COVID itself. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, I feel like I'm in purgatory. Mm hmm. So I get it. I are are your doc know. are your doctors helping you? No. Are they sitting down? No, and they're gaslighting me. They're gaslighting. Or what's that? Well, they're gaslighting me in the sense of of you know the the excuse of ninety nine percent of hospitalizations and deaths are from COVID, which sounds just like the CDC and the uh, FDA r remarks. Whereas we know that's not true now because of the efficacy of the, the vaccinations. So because we know that, um, that, that, that that's, that's a problem. Now, of course, I have told you on numerous occasions that I would very, very seriously consider Novavax. Mm -hmm. But Novavax seems to be five years away at this point. Yeah, they they keep delaying it. They, they keep, why they keep why it do they keep delaying it? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I've not seen the data on that. I, I now, know. I, I will share something with you. I did get some more blood work done mm -hmm. and I was really happy with some of it. I was really happy with a, a, a good chunk of it. My, my vitamin D count was around 65 now. Good. And, and my vitamin B was north of a thousand. Mm. Um, B12? So I was happy. You mean B12? Yeah, B12. That's yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was really happy about that, 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 that the supplements, because there, there, there are studies showing, you know, respiratory infections yeah. and, um, you know, and, and again, I haven't been sick since the pandemic, so but I'm, to be fair, I've been also living under a rock. I, I'm a little confused about the gaslighting. What were they gaslighting you about exactly? No, they were gaslighting me about why am I not vaccinated already? And I flat right. out told, and, and this was with, and, and I'll go further. I, I originally was thinking about going for Johnson and Johnson before, yeah. um, before the issues with blood clots and thrombocytopenia. Yeah. yeah. And, um, because I, I did not really try. See, I'm I'm a person, and again, even with computers, I I don't trust the newest brands of anything. I, I understand. That's fine. But what you know, India's got a vaccine that uh, might fit your needs, right? Yeah, but I don't live in India. But it, that one might get some distribution here. Do you, do you, would your doctors help you with that kind of thing? Maybe I mean I'll I could I well I have an appointment in a couple of weeks so yeah, I can but I, the, the, I think the I think Joe the, maybe change your perspective a little bit and get focused on how can I get safely vaccinated <laughs> because that's how you're going to move around in the world again and that's what we need to do we need to get you out from out of the rock and safely vaccinated so how can we mitigate risk and and really. You know, you can bring the papers in or the citations in on all the problems because they should be, if not aware of it, they should at least be able to address it. And, uh, and you know, and if they're confident that you don't have a problem, how can they be so confident? And what else might we do? They really have them help you solve the problem. How can I get safely vaccinated? Because, because okay? it's not the easiest, it's not the easiest thing in thing to do with I know. You know, people with blood disorders i understand but we got to get you and out we got to get right we have to change i i would urge you you know decision making comes from a perspective and you got to change your perspective the perspective is how do i get out from under the rock not just how do i say safe how do i say as safe as possible get out from under the right. rock that's what needs right. to happen now joe can, can i ask can, time. can i ask you one more quick question yeah. that's not related to you or yeah. i um yeah. how's rex feeling he uh, had some vomiting across Thanksgiving. With Susan, I'll answer all Okay, this. so I took him to this emergency room, and they said they said it could be up to Rex six our hours. Dog, by the way. Yeah, he the day before Thanksgiving, he he had been vomiting for twenty four hours, and a little bit of blood, and and I he, you go online, it's like see a vet immediately. So yeah. I I threw all my Thanksgiving dish groceries to the side, and I I she ran over, out. and we sat in the car for two hours or an hour. 
outside of an ER in Pasadena, mm-hmm. and they said it would be up. People had been waiting six hours Ugh. with their dog, in, and then they saw Rex. He looked yeah. okay. So he, no, I, you more know than what okay. I did? He was running my all prayers over the place. and my wait, well wishes. Wait, wait, wait. You worked. know what I did? Remember when we did the show with the guys from AirVet? Yes. Uh, so I got on the phone and I got the guy from AirVet and he thought I was a complete lunatic. And he was like, he said, give your dog some Pepto-Bismol. And it cost me 35 bucks. Yep. If I had walked into wow. that ER, they would have given an x-ray. It would have been $500. Easy. I would have sat there for six hours. Yep. And I gave him Pepto-Bismol and people stopped feeding him people food for a day or so. He mm-hmm. he vomited again, but he's fine now. He's totally fine. He, he Joe, I think was yeah. eating pine cones. He likes to eat oh, pine geez. cones. That's, and and oh, I, my I, I was cleaning the grass and, off on Thanksgiving day and found that the squirrels have dismantled about a hundred pine cones in the back and he he's can't a total resist. Mooch. Yeah. He probably ate and, too and, much. And, and by the way, I want to say hello to all the locals gang. The, oh, I see Tom and I see Casey and gang. I want to say hello to them. So Drew, thank you very much. All right. I'm all for telemedicine. And I'm going to have dog. Tom and Tom's and Casey get on your case about we're going to get you off from out of the rock. That's our, yeah. our new goal. Okay. We'll get you a vaccine. All right. All right, Joe. Very well. all right buddy. Drew will come hold your hand afterwards. Yeah, I will. I, I'm going to be in the city next week. So we'll take a look at that. <laughs> Let's do it on Sunday. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll happily come out. To, he's in Long Island, right? He's uh, northern up north. So we'll find him. Uh, so yeah, e- email Susan, uh, Joe. You want to uh, have a sleepover with Dr. Drew? <laughs> come come to the city, and I'll I'll vax you. Uh, so anyway, thank you, thanks Alec Barrison, thank you, That's to Caleb. A boys, weekend. Uh, thank on. you guys on Clubhouse. We have to wrap this thing up. We'll be back maybe on Thursday. Uh, Susan, is that a maybe? Maybe it depends on when you go. If, okay, if so something maybe if, Thursday. If you get an appointment on Friday, then we'll we'll just keep it open, but. Okay. We can just take calls. We don't yeah, have to we'll have Yeah, we'll try to be guests. back on Thursday around the That's same time. That's a better time. way to go. Then you don't have and, to And uh, we thank you on Clubhouse. We're going to end the room. And uh, those of you, the rest of you. I love Alex Berenson. He's he's a hard one to get on. So he's a, if he comes back again, if he can come on Thursday, I'll bring him back. He's always very interesting. He's very interesting. Oh, I know. He does great sound bites. I love him. <laughs> okay. Yeah, put it out on social media. So he's just like, what... he's so well-read. He knows everything about everything. Yeah, he's a New York Times reporter. He's been a science reporter for years. He sort of understands the thinking and understands how to approach looking at what 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 is happening in the moment, and what you know what a sci- scientific establishments look like, what how science is done, that kind of thing. He's familiar with that, and he's not worried about what people think about him. No, he's not. So get the book. Uh, we're going to be reading it, Pandemia, and we'll see you guys hopefully Thursday around the same time, three o'clock. We appreciate you being here. We'll see you then. Oh, oh, oh. oh wait, we also wait. have Dave Navarro coming on Wednesday. Oh, wait, no, I beg your pardon. Thursday, what am I talking about? I have, Tomorrow's I have, Vinay Prasad. I have Vinay Prasad tomorrow. It's good. This, this another, you're going to love him. Don't don't leave. Right. We have Vinay, Vinay tomorrow. Vinay is a and then brilliant, we have brilliant Dave physician. Navarro. I just booked Dave Navarro while we were doing okay, this Okay, Vinay is an amazingly brilliant thinker. You're going to, you're going to, we're going to get into vaccines a little more with him because he's got some really important ideas about that. So we'll and we're going to talk about rock and roll on Wednesday and, and hallucinogens. On Wednesday? Yeah, with Dave Navarro. I'm not sure I can do that, but okay. What do you mean? Thursday is when I was planning on. You can't do Wednesday. Okay, I just we'll talk about him. it. All right, so I'm Wednesday, hopefully move. I'll be here. If we can do that like at 2.30, <laughs> then I can do it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow at 3 Pacific. See yes, you then. boss. Okay. I tried uh, shortening or lessening my uh, masturbations. All right, so you made it through two yesterday. Um, no, that wasn't. That didn't start yesterday. I'm, I oh. just thought about you when thought I did about, this You might yesterday. start it today. I, I did this in L.A. Oh, you did one a day in L.A.? Uh, no, oh. I, I did, um, why are, we, why are we talking to my drug addicts? Like, yeah. So you stopped using, right? <laughs> no, no, I didn't stop. No. <laughs> like, no. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at 